Welcome, dear readers, to Books with a View, a YouTube channel where I talk about books as you look at nice views. Today, we'll be discussing Dennis Lehane's Sacred, about a couple of detectives racing around the country to solve a case. Usually, the characters in a Lehane novel are set in and around Boston, but in this story, they venture to Florida. To go with the travel theme, I hiked to Charlotte Douglas International Airport to look at a lovely mobile art piece they have above a sushi restaurant. It depicts various modes and methods of aviation through the ages, so enjoy feasting your eyes on that while I gab about a dark crime thriller, and try not to get distracted by the travelers feasting on fish. Sacred is the third installment in Dennis Lehane's Kinsey Gennaro mystery series. Patrick Kinsey and Angie Gennaro are two Boston detectives who work together to solve crimes that usually take them on a journey through the dark underbelly of Dorchester. The first novel in the series, A Drink Before the War, is a solid first outing. It establishes the two leads and their working relationship pretty well. The main plot, involving missing documents about a local gang war, is suitable, if a little anonymous. The second book, Darkness Take My Hand, ratchets up the personal stakes when a serial killer threatens Patrick and Angie as they try to solve a missing persons case. It's in this novel that Lehane really finds his voice, mixing propulsive plotting with genuine moments of character growth. It also deals with much darker subject matter and treads the line between the horror and detective genres delicately. Lehane takes his characters on a wild ride and neither of them come out unscathed. But now it's time for Sacred, the novel of the hour. In this video, I'm going to talk about Patrick and Angie's third major case together, which has them reeling from the events of the second book. So for those who read out of order, uh, stop, stop doing that. Sacred starts off similarly to another seminal work of detective fiction, The Big Sleep. Patrick and Angie are summoned by an incredibly wealthy man to his estate and tasked with untangling a conspiracy involving his spoiled daughter who's found herself in a heap of trouble. In Lehane's version of the story though, the daughter is likely dead. Billionaire Trevor Stone reveals that he's already hired a private detective, Jay Becker, who's also disappeared. Patrick and Angie are hired to pick up where Jay left off and to find Stone's daughter, Desiree. There's a fun subversion of the hard-boiled detective trope in the first chapter. Patrick and Angie are abducted by the mysterious billionaire who's about to assign them to his case, but once the blindfolds come off and the mysterious billionaire reveals himself, Patrick cuts him short. He turns to Angie and says, How you doing? Unlike other hard-boiled detectives, Patrick isn't going to move the plot along as fast as possible. There aren't many moments in a Chandler novel where Marlowe just checks in with a friend before an imperious stranger starts an exposition dump. It makes Patrick more human and likable that he's more concerned for Angie's welfare than getting the inciting instant of the novel going. A stumbling block for a modern reader might be Patrick's sense of humor. I can recognize a fair amount of his jokes are, and I try not to use this word, but they are in fact cheesy. Being stuck in Patrick's head is a bit like listening to your dad's comedic perspective on politics and technological advancements. He makes a Mission Impossible reference to signify how futuristic it feels to see another character using a primitive version of GPS. Granted, the novel was published in 1997, so part of Patrick's humor being outdated is due to the fact that the novel itself is, well, dated. Conversely, since the main characters generally keep things light, I'm always struck by how easily Dennis Lehane can raise the danger level of any situation to unexpected levels. Early on in the story, Patrick has almost gotten away from a cult-like organization when a police officer stops him and his pursuer, a member of the organization. As a reader, you think the worst outcome that could happen is that Patrick would be arrested and taken to the police station, but Lehane gives you an outcome that's far worse. The police officer asks for Patrick's ID, and not only tells the goon from the organization exactly who he is, but elaborates on his case from the last novel, Darkness Take My Hand, wherein he stopped two serial-killing lunatics. This not only gives the bad guys Patrick's name, but his occupation and a specific case to cross-reference. In other words, he's been utterly exposed. And that's not all. Pretty early on in the novel, Angie and Patrick's heavy-duty backup, a likable psycho named Bubba, starts a year-long prison sentence for possession of an unlicensed firearm. This shows that they are even more exposed. Which isn't good news, since the bad guys for this case seem to have tendrils in every powerful organization imaginable. IRS, police, etc. Lehane's so eminently readable and his plot choices are a big reason why. At around the midpoint of the novel, when Angie and Patrick go to Florida, they find that Jay Becker is still alive, not looking well, and that Trevor Stone has actually hired Jay to kill his daughter Desiree. It's a great series of reveals, handled with the Lahanian deafness that incorporates humor and drama into the proceedings. 
He's terrific at making sure the plot never gets too grim, even though it gets progressively more lurid. But, since Patrick and Angie are our protagonists, we the reader never feel like the train is going off the rails. Justice will more than likely prevail, even if it is a somewhat pyrrhic victory. Midway through the novel, there's a thrilling shootout on a bridge during a rainy night. It feels cinematic in the best way possible. Lehane definitely knows how to use tropes from the world of film to get the reader to picture what's happening while keeping his characters grounded in the scene. Patrick and Angie try in vain to help someone from a vehicle that is teetering delicately off the edge of the bridge. It doesn't feel cliched as you're reading it because you've never seen Patrick or Angie react to a scene like this, even though you've probably seen something similar play out in a few movies. His novels so rarely turn into action movies that the few times he does write an action set piece into a novel, it's extremely effective. After the incident on the bridge, Patrick and Angie are being held by Florida police and hunted by Trevor Stone. Enter Cheswick Hartman, a high-powered attorney who Patrick helped out on another case. He serves as a bit of a deus ex machina when he shows up toward the end of the novel. Patrick and Angie don't have too many options, and suddenly a man shows up to offer unbelievable assistance. If Hartman was in the first two books, I don't remember him, and of course deus ex machinas aren't a sign of terrific writing. But I love Hartman's personality. He walks in like he owns the place, cursing up a storm and brings doom to all the Floridians who would dare intimidate his client. It adds extra danger, then, when even Hartman shows fear at the prospect of Patrick being in Trevor Stone's crosshairs. In short, the lawyer's a great addition to the book. I just wish he'd been added to the story a bit more organically. Late in the story, we finally get our femme fatale, and it's none other than Desiree Stone herself, the missing daughter of Trevor. She reveals herself to Patrick and Angie, and they agree to help her, but it doesn't take long for Patrick to see through her manipulations. Suddenly, the novel has two villains, Trevor and Desiree, and it's murky exactly what their motivations are for wanting each other dead. Lahane clearly named her Desiree because her main plot function is that so many people desire her, often against their better judgment. For the most part, the people who desire Desiree end up undesirably dead. Lahane's a talented writer, but I wouldn't describe him as subtle. It's a terrific section of the novel, because even though Patrick and Angie are trapped between a rock and a hard place, Trevor and Desiree, they never truly seem down for the count. It's also when Angie decides to take their relationship to a physical level, which is weirdly important to the plot. Since Patrick and Angie are lovers, he's able to ignore the charms of Desiree as she attempts to seduce and manipulate him. Sure, as I say this, I realize how clumsy and contrived it actually sounds, but hey, Lahane's doing his best. Patrick's so in love with Angie that he's able to be a better detective, thinking like a dick instead of thinking with his dick. The Patrick-Angie relationship works really well once they become more than just professional partners. As a reader, you're a little worried that their personal life will make their jobs harder, but they seem to be taking their new relationship status in stride. When they stake out Jay's apartment while Desiree is inside with a mystery man, they don't even have to use verbal communication to signal that Angie will tail Desiree and Patrick will tail the mystery man. They do it with hand signals, a great way to show that the characters are probably going to work well with the boundaries between personal and professional becoming non-existent. And then comes the inevitable. Angie is kidnapped by Desiree, which also comes with the sneaky reveal of the novel's title, revealed by Patrick's thoughts. Angie wasn't just my partner, she wasn't just my best friend, and she wasn't just my lover. She was all those things, sure, but she was far more. Ever since we made love the other night, it had begun to dawn on me that what lay between us since we were children wasn't just special, it was sacred. Sacred indeed, Patrick. You've got to do whatever it takes to keep Angie and keep her safe. His reflection on his relationship spurs us headlong into the climax which I won't reveal in full because that's what the pleasure of reading is for. Suffice it to say that the villains go head to head, and it's all very exciting. Overall, I like that this series works much better if you read them in order, as opposed to other private eye literary series where you could read them in any order. It's a good mixture of serialized and episodic storytelling. I imagine the publisher probably wished the series didn't function as one continuous story, but it makes for a much richer experience for the reader. Events build on themselves in incredibly satisfying ways. Sacred has a lot to do with the gruesome fallout from Darkness Take My Hand, in both good ways and bad. Angie particularly is still recovering from the physical and emotional damage she took in that book, taking a bullet from a lunatic and suffering the loss of her ex-husband. 
in Sacred, she's really not ready for a relationship with Patrick, and he doesn't do anything to rush her. He gives her space to heal and acts as her support system. Also, the novel uses the events of the last book to bolster the reputations of the detectives. Everywhere they go in Sacred, someone always seems to point out how they figured out a terrifying serial killing spree and put an end to it themselves. Basically, they've got tremendous street cred, which is a far cry from where they started in Lehane's first book, A Drink Before the War. A side note to readers tempted to read out of order, Sacred does say the name of the secret villain of the last book dozens of times, so it definitely deflates a lot of darkness take my hand stakes. You've been warned. That's basically it for the book, but now I'm realizing I didn't really talk about what makes this book so distinctive from the first two. It's not really the plot or the characters, it's the setting! Lehane clearly had fun with the Florida specifics in the middle section of the novel. It's a fun choice to scoop up Patrick and Angie from their comfort zone in Boston and drop them in the grimy weirdness of Florida. Angie seems to thrive in Florida, getting an amazing tan that seems to drive every man she meets wild, and Patrick loves the seafood. I'm not sure I'd like to see them travel to another state in every other book in the series, since Dorchester is so ingrained in Lehane's DNA as an author, but for this one it's fun to see the detectives go to the peculiar peninsula. Lastly, a Kinsey Gennaro mystery has been adapted to film once in 2007, the Ben Affleck directed Gone Baby Gone. I haven't read the book yet, it's next on my Lehane list, or seen the movie, but it looks like Patrick is played by Casey Affleck and Angie by Michelle Monaghan. Both good picks for 2007, but let's see if we can't dreamcast Sacred for a 2022 adaptation. I'll pick. Chris Evans is Patrick Kinsey. He's a local Boston boy who's also looking for another franchise now that his Marvel run is over. Margot Robbie is Angie Gennaro. I have no doubt she could nail a Boston accent, and I bet she and Evans would have great chemistry. James Remar is Trevor Stone, because he's got a great bad guy's voice. Anna Darmos is Desiree Stone. She'd have a lot of fun playing both sides of Desiree's character, the innocent victim and the manipulative femme fatale. John Krasinski is Jay Becker, another Boston native who could easily play Patrick's buddy. James Spader is Cheswick Hartman, a third Bostonite who could strike fear into the hearts of Floridian cops. And Paul Walter Hauser is Bubba, because why not get another I, Tanya cast member in here? And that's all I have for you bibliophiles, so thank you for watching. If you liked what you heard, subscribe for more book reviews in the future, like the video, and comment if there are any novels in particular you'd like me to read. And as always, remember that we have a date on April 1st to watch Failsafe.